Let's bring our eyes to the chart to my right. What we're looking at is basically the 34 top contenders in reference to reducing the likelihood of testing positive for SARS-CoV-2, the virus purported to cause COVID-19. Out of these 34 contenders, they first started with nearly 3,000 candidates. Out of these 34, the top finisher, I should say one of the top finishers, was melatonin. So basically, through big data, they were able to see that the strongest correlation in reducing the likelihood of testing positive for COVID-19 was melatonin. Now, we're not going to go through dosage. Even though standard dosage, most individuals in the market take three milligrams, but however, though, we don't know how strongly that applies to the particular study here as reference to, to taking more, more effective or is taken less more effective? We don't know until for future studies are done. But however, though, correlation-wise, melatonin ranked number one out of 3,000 possible candidates. What we are going to cover in this video is exactly how they came to that hypothesis, or I should say conclusion in reference to the big data study. But these charts, these relational charts, which we will look at, at towards the end, are just astounding visually. So let us proceed as follows. Researchers use big data approach to identify melatonin as possible COVID-19 treatment. Results from a Cleveland Clinic-led study suggest that melatonin, a hormone that regulates the sleep-wake cycle and is commonly used as an over-the-counter sleep aid, may be a viable treatment option for COVID-19. Proceed a little further in the article. Analysis of patient data from Cleveland's Clinic COVID-19 registry also revealed that melatonin usage was associated with the nearly 30% reduced likelihood of testing positive for SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. After adjusting for age, race, smoking history, and various disease comorbidities, notably the reduced likelihood of testing positive for the virus increased from 30 to 52% for African Americans when adjusted for the same variables. So again, I want to use wording that is basically in parallel to what the researchers are utilizing, and that is reduction or reduced likelihood of testing positive until future studies are done. To proceed as follows. Here the researchers harness network medicine methodologies and large-scale electronic health records from Cleveland Clinic patients to identify clinical manifestations and pathologies common between COVID-19 and other diseases. Specifically, the, they measured the proximity between host genes, proteins, and those as well associated with 64 other diseases across several disease categories, malignant cancer and autoimmune, cardiovascular, metabolic, neurological, and pulmonary diseases, where close proximity indicates a higher likelihood of pathological associations between the diseases. We're gonna look at some of those charts in a few seconds. Again, as we go towards the end. Quoting, they found, for example, that proteins associated with respiratory distress syndrome and sepsis, two main causes of death in patients with severe COVID-19, were highly connected with multiple SARS-CoV-2 proteins. This signals to us, quoting, explained Dr. Cheng, I hope I'm pronouncing that appropriately, that a drug already approved to treat these respiratory conditions may have some utility in also treating COVID-19 by acting on those shared biological targets, again, for future research. Overall, they determined, this part is real intriguing, that autoimmune, inflammatory bowel disease, pulmonary, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, and pulmonary fibrosis, as well as, and neurological, depression, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, Diseases showed significant proximity to SARS-CoV-2 genes, proteins, and identified 34 drugs, as we saw in the very beginning, as repurposing candidates, melatonin, chief among them. Now, the interesting part about this, without adding uh, too much of my own bias in reference to it, if you think about distancing and social distancing, physical distancing is the word we should be used, and so on and so forth, uh, you run the risk of dysbiosis, meaning the microbiome tends to get tweaked in a way that's not favorable. And henceforth, uh, when you 
having an overly sanitized situation, what does it lead to? Higher levels of autoimmune diseases, which in this case, higher levels of autoimmune disease lead to increased susceptibility to SARS-CoV-2. Social distancing, we'll use the word that is commonly used today, even though there's no measure of a social distance. Also, can apply when people are isolated or lonely, it gives rise to depression. So, just a, as a side trail, many of the pandemic measures that we're utilizing today have continued too far. Uh, you can see, ironically, increasing susceptibility to succumbing to SARS-CoV-2, but I digress. All right, now what I'm gonna do real fast, I am gonna read from the full abstract, and as I'm reading for the full abstract, I'll show it for a second, I'm gonna show you some of the charts to encourage you to link to the full study so you could see, as I see, these incredibly, incredibly beautiful relational charts to show how big data was utilized in order to basically pull on clues to come to its hypothesis that melatonin in reference to correlation reduces the likelihood of testing positive by as much as 52% in African American communities or in the very least 30%. But to proceed as follows. This part, I hope you find it as, as amazing as I do. But to proceed. Finally, we computationally prioritized nearly 3,000 FDA approved investigational drugs, potential anti-SARS-CoV-2 effects using network proximity measurements and GSEA analysis. A list of 34 repurposable drugs, repurposable, with their reported antiviral prof profiles are highlighted, among which are eight drugs are currently on ongoing COVID-19 trials. We further explored drug disease, I'm quoting obviously, outcome relationships for melatonin using a large scale COVID-19 patient registry database. Please forgive me if I'm speaking kind of fast, a lot to cover. We found that among individuals who received testing for SARS-CoV-2, melatonin was associated with a 28% and 52% reduced likelihood a positive laboratory test for SARS-CoV-2 in all combined pop that in the all combined population and Black Americans, respectively, after adjusting for age, sex, race, smoking, and various disease comorbidities, using user-active comparative design, we further found that melatonin usage was associated with a reduced likelihood of a positive laboratory test or labor laboratory test. Result for SARS-CoV-2 compared to the use of ARBs and ACEIs as well. Exogenous melatonin may be a benefit in older patients with COVID-19 given the aging. See, that's an interesting aspect. As a person tends to get a little older, melatonin levels tend to decline. Melatonin levels decline. What is one of the most vulnerable populations in reference to SARS-CoV-2? The elderly. As well as, again, we have to give a side to vitamin D. Vitamin D is very impressive as well. Will they work well together? That's a hypothesis. It makes sense they may. Will they cancel each other out? Probably not, but still, studies need to be done to validate. Given the aging-related reduction of endogenous melatonin and the greater vulnerability of old individual tools, individuals, to mortality from SARS-CoV-2, the later potential due to declining immunity, um, immunosenescence, Moreover, melatonin suppresses NLRP3 inflammasome activation induced by cigarette smoking and attenuates pulmonary inflammation. Not only the reduction of the NFKB P65 and tumor necrosis factor expression, but also via increase in anti-inflammatory cytokines such as interleukin-10 and interleukin-6, which can also have anti-inflammatory effects. Thus, large-scale observational studies of randomized controlled trials are needed to validate the clinical benefit of melatonin for patients with COVID-19. It would be important, however, that the trials be designed with the understanding of the mechanism of the drug to be repurposed. For example, it would be obvious that drugs that decrease viral entry, e.g., part of melatonin's action, would be beneficial in preventing infection or very early in the COVID-19 course, but may be inconsequential when utilized in severe or end-stage infection. So maybe if you're, as you're taking melatonin, you take it in the beginning, it may be great in preventing the likelihood of succumbing to SARS-CoV-2, but way towards the end of where it'd be infected in full-blown COVID-19, will it be as effective? That's for future research. But several randomized controlled trials be performed to test the clinical benefits of melatonin patients with COVID-19. Again, in addition to selective estrogen modulation and melatonin in early COVID-19, Sentinel trial is underway to test the combination therapy of melatonin and or tormephine 
and approved selective estrogen receptor modulator, which would be interesting for patients with early and mild COVID-19 and the clinical trials, as you see. Hope you enjoyed. Hope you find this information of use. I regret I can't, uh, the study itself did not refer or reference dosage amounts. Again, as I alluded to prior in the first part of this, average market uh, intake tends to be about three milligrams of melatonin. Uh, usually people take it at night before going to bed or for jet lag and so on and so forth to reset the circadian rhythms. But in any case, the DOI citation will be there. The link will be there to follow. And again, incredibly, incredibly eloquent, beautiful relational charts in reference to how things connect and all come together. In this case, they followed those paths, ended up with Peloton. Again, we're off to our channel signing off. Gratitude, thank you. Once again, Saturday we do the data analysis. If you want to be interested, interested in the data analysis in reference to vulnerable populations, how other countries are as far as controls, so on and so forth. You're more than welcome to visit uh, what, Saturday, two o'clock in the morning, for those familiar. But in any case, gratitude, thank you. And I look forward to seeing you all, one way or the other, in the next seven days. Catch you next time. Bye.